Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. I think most of you know that Jim Lynch passed away several weeks ago. I talked with his wife Lois. She assured me that it was okay to continue to use his songs. And so today we've chosen one of his very favorites. And I hope you'll continue to enjoy his music as we use it from time to time. God bless you. And we'll be back with the study in just a few moments. They tell me of the home far beyond the sky. They tell me of the home far away. They would tell me of a home where no storm clouds lie. Oh, they tell me of the unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Our subject today is going to be born a sinner, born again through grace. Born a sinner, born again through grace. What does that mean, Pastor? Well, you know, we have questions from time to time and comments often about uh, our life uh, uh, as we live in our natural uh, unredeemed situation and condition. I uh, often find people saying to me, you know, Pastor, I just don't understand. Brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so or uh, Mr. or Mrs. or uh, Dad or Mom, whatever the situation may be, uh, they were good people. They they didn't ever do anything wrong. Uh, they had good moral standards. They did the best they could to help others. Uh, they were not a problem for society. Uh, they stood on solid ground as far as ethics were concerned. And I'm just sure they're in heaven with the Lord. Well, or they're going to heaven with the Lord if they haven't yet passed away. 
And the answer to that is found in the scripture. And I think it's very important that maybe we talk about it. I don't hear very many people talking about this. And um, so in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, we read these words. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Now we also know that there's another scripture in the Bible that says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you say, well, how can that be? Well, let's go to verse 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So you see, and I've spoken to this several times in passing, but never really got into uh, talking about it too much, I guess. Uh, what we need to understand is that when we're born, when we come out of the womb from that moment, from, in fact, from the moment of conception, uh, we are born and we are conceived with a dead spirit. A spirit that God gave unto us that had been contaminated by a law of sin and death brought on by old Adam. And we find that uh, every child that is born into uh, uh, this world that uh, is of the lineage of Adam, we find is born with a natural spirit of sin, rebellion, condemnation, all kinds of the stuff that comes forth as we live our daily life. And though many people have the ability to uh, overcome the uh, terrible uh, fruit of that and have some discipline about uh, how they live their life, there are others who don't. But regardless of whether they do or they do not, we find that they are not able to find that place of communion and fellowship and purity of spirit with Almighty God, uh, which He created us to have and to be, and intended that we should walk in the righteousness and the purity of the Heavenly Father, uh, absolute truth, uh, uh, free from the bondage of uh, corruption and all the stuff that we put up with in this world today, and as a result, we are born with a common nature that is not of God, but what is it of? It tells us right here, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In other words, we are born with a disobedient spirit, a spirit that is in rebellion against God, a spirit that is so consumed with the will of the flesh and the desires of, of our carnal nature that we cannot or never will have a, a spirit of communication and fellowship and the power of righteousness and purity that comes from God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, Lord and Savior. Praise His name. So we have to come to a place where I have to recognize one thing. What we call sin today is a sin. Yes, it is. Uh, but really it's the fruit of a sinful condition. It's the fruit of a spirit that was contaminated with death and it died in its relationship to the Heavenly Father when Adam sinned. I've told you that many times, but we haven't really explained it maybe as we should. So let's go to verse number 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation. That means we all had our experience. We all had our uh, actions of life uh, in times past in the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Now, what are we learning here? Stop and think about it. This is the Word of God. 
And it explains the whole situation in that third verse. Why? We had our activity, our actions, our deeds, our exercise of uh, uh, decisions, and, and the way we thought and dealt and lived was not with the Spirit of God, not with the Spirit of purity and truth and, and, uh, and uh, uh, holiness in the righteousness of God. No, it was uh, what? We were by nature the children of wrath even as others. That means that we were born with a spirit of anger, a spirit that resisted God, a spirit that resisted life itself in many ways, a spirit that led us into all kinds of difficulty and uh, wrongdoing, uh, not only just the deeds of the, of the flesh, but of the mind, and a spirit that uh, uh, caused us uh, without even being aware that we have that spirit of wrath within us, but caused us to walk in a spirit of re resentment, rebellion against the things that God created us to be and to enjoy. As a result of that, we go to verse 4, and thank God we get into a, a happier situation in verse 4. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Now isn't it strange? We're born with a spirit of wrath, a spirit that is automatically by nature in rebellion against law, in rebellion against truth, in rebellion against doing the right thing, a spirit that is determined to satisfy a sinful, deteriorating flesh, uh, uh, carnal as it is, uh, and uh, that does the will of the flesh and the carnal mind instead of doing what we wish we could do, what we strive to do, what we desire to be in the presence of God, and that is uh, in God's perfect will, He will, and by the way, He only has one will, and it's always perfect. That's a little side thought, I'll just tell you this much. I've heard lots of people say, well, you know, I know this isn't God's perfect will, uh, but, and then they go on, they say, well, he'll let me do this, he'll let me do that. I want to tell you something. There is no such thing as an imperfect will with God. He has one will, one desire, it's always pure, it's always holy, it's always perfect, it's always righteous. And even though when he brings forth judgment and damnation upon the evil, it is still righteous in the reality of the truth of Almighty God himself. We reap what we sow, remember? Anyway, just to share those thoughts with you, I want to get back now and we learn some things that I think is very important. We who have been born again, and remember I said, the title of the message is Born a Sinner, but Born Again Through Grace. And what did it say there in verse 4? God who rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace we're saved, aren't we? Verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know whether you figured that one out yet or not, but if you're a child of God, born again by the Spirit of God, you're very much aware that for the first time after your conversion or upon your conversion, uh, you came to the point that you realized that, that God was real to you, that He is interested in you, and you realized that He did want you to serve Him. And you came to the place where you answered the call of God in your dead spirit, in your carnal mind, uh, to uh, repent of your sin and to turn unto him. And he would cleanse you from your sin because Jesus Christ 
died as the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God that was slain for all who would believe upon him as Lord and Redeemer. And you came to the place where you realize something that the worldly people who have never been converted cannot possibly understand. I guess I came to the thought of uh, talking about this this past week when I saw uh, a public uh, so-called news media mocking the vice president because he had said to uh, someone publicly uh, that he prays unto the Lord, he talks unto the Lord, and uh, uh, he said, and the Lord talks to me. And oh my, they laughed and they scoffed and they mocked and they made fun and uh, and they said all of this stuff, and I know I mentioned it last week, but uh, I just didn't want to bear down upon it. And that was the nature, the rebellion, in its uh, nth degree that we saw that we're all born with uh, before we come to the knowledge of, of Almighty God and the price that Jesus paid that we might be born again. And thank God most of you, many of you that are listening, have been born again. And you know that when you pray, when you talk to the Lord, He hears you. And you know that He also talks to you. And He lets you know that He loves you. He lets you know that you need to make a decision this way or that way. He lets you know that He will lead you by His Spirit, that He will show you the way to live and the way that is straight and narrow. Very limited. That word straight means constricted in the old language. Constricted and narrow. It isn't a broad way that leads to destruction. It's a narrow way of life and truth. Doesn't have a lot of room for us to veer one way or the other as long as we walk in communion and fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. And remember that when Jesus ascended to be with the Father, he left the presence of the Holy Spirit here on this earth, yes, and the Holy Spirit leads and guides and directs and even instills wisdom and knowledge information and understanding and causes us to have an actual relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. And we again are reminded uh, there are those who say, well, you know, we can all get to heaven. There's a lot of ways to get to heaven. Uh, not the heaven that is eternal, not the heaven that is well, I won't say eternal because it's going to pass away one of these days, but there will be a new one in its place. Anyway, I want to share with you uh, that uh, uh, there is only one way, one, and that's through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for your sins and mine. And if you haven't come to that place of, of uh, repenting of your sin and becoming genuinely converted. I don't mean having a knowledge in your head about the Word of God. I don't mean having an understanding in your head that He's the Son of God. I mean having a relationship with God to the point that you've come to the place that you said, Lord, I am indeed a sinner. I can't help myself. I live with the dead spirit is what you're saying. And it's a spirit of wrath and rebellion against God, against purity, against holiness, against upright living. And we spend a lot of time looking at, well, you know, uh, this sin, well, that's a bad sin. But this one over here, it's worse. It's one thing to have this sin and it's another one to have this one. And yes, indeed, the Bible says that there is a sin unto death. But it's already you're already there if you're dead in sin, if you have not yet found the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, real 
in the conversion, the new birth of your spirit. And actually, it's a new creation of your spirit. It is a spirit that God recreates in you that was the same spirit spirit that Jesus Christ the man walked in here as he taught the word and preached the word showed us the love of God revealed the heavenly father to us in the magnitude that we know and understand today as a result we have to come to the place where we let the born again which many people laugh at Oh, that's a bunch of born-again believers. You better watch out for them. They're a little bit nutty. No, we just came to our senses and became sane. We just walked into a place where we could have a relationship with the Almighty God, the Creator of all things. We just came to a place where we could look the world in the face, but we could look God in the face and say, Thank you, God, and thank you, Lord Jesus, for buying me out of the bondage of the law of sin and death. We can rejoice with the stability and confidence and faith, the certainty that we will not only enjoy the presence of God in this ungodly, unwholesome uh, world of sin and destruction, but that when we leave this world of sin and destruction, we're going to eternally be sealed in the kingdom of God if, if we're faithful in our walk with God after we become converted until the end. And I think I told you two or three times in the last few weeks, the end is when we pass from this life into eternity, or the Final end is when Jesus returns for his bride, and if that should happen while we're still alive, we'll be instantly changed, and we will be instantly sealed in the eternities with our Lord Jesus Christ for the ages to come. Thank God for his love, for his mercy, for his understanding, for his coming with compassion to rescue us, from the bondage that we were cast into when we were conceived. Because you see, when Adam died, he died spiritually that day when he refused to serve and obey God and rebelled against God to please his wife. Think about that. Now, verse 6. I think I read it, but I want to talk about it some more. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now you say, well, I haven't sit down in heaven. Oh, well, maybe you need to. Now, come on. I'm still here. I'm still alive. I have nothing wrong with me. I've got a, my life ahead of me. I haven't sit down in heaven. He's not talking about your carnal, sinful, ungodly flesh. He's talking about that righteous spirit that for the first time in all of your life, when you became converted and genuinely asked the Lord to cleanse you from your sin through the blood of Christ, you instantly had a new created spirit within you that can commune and fellowship both with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Heavenly Father. Well, pastor, has that ever happened to you? It happens to me all the time. It can happen to you all the time. There's many times, many times, when I've been in grave danger, death was at the door. And all I had time to do was say, Jesus. And instantly there was an intervention. Instantly there was a response. And my life was spared. I'm not talking about once or twice. I'm talking about several times down through the years as this old preacher has taught the word, ministered the word to the best of his ability. Sometimes I haven't done a very good job of it, but I'm still trying 
and I'm still believing, and I'm still walking in the fullness and the strength and the power and the love and the grace of Almighty God and my Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to know the communion and the fellowship and the, and the wonderful relationship is a beautiful and glorious experience. And yes, my spirit is lifted into a place where I know that I stand before the throne of God. In my spirit, I have audience with Him. I can talk with Him. I can tell him that I love him. I can tell him that I need him. I can tell him that I'm scared. I can tell him that I'm bold. I can tell him that I'm right. And I can tell him I thought I was, but I was wrong. And he still loves me. I can tell him all the things I need to give me guidance, direction, sustenance, protection, keeping, strength, and ability to continue on in my fellowship with him and teaching his word as long as he gives this old flesh of mine the strength and the ability to speak it. Praise his wonderful name. Yes, I sit at the throne of God. I sit before my Lord Jesus Christ as he stands by the throne of God or sits there. I sit in heavenly places. And so do you, if you've genuinely been converted. And if you haven't learned what that all means yet, why don't you start talking to the Lord? Why don't you start just opening yourself up unto Him? He knows everything about you anyway. You're not going to hide anything from Him. You're not going to keep any secrets from Him. And so you might just as well say, Lord... I thank you for what you've done for me, but Lord, I failed you. You see, Lord, I let the old flesh and the old carnal mind of mine, I let it rule me and overrule what my fellowship and my beautiful born-again relationship with you bought for me. And, and Lord, uh, I, I just, I made a major mistake. A major mistake. And Lord, Father, I'm sorry. I wish you would forgive me. No, no, Lord, I don't wish that. I know you forgive me because you promised me that you would. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to sit in heavenly places with you and to sit before the Heavenly Father and to know you're there by my side, supporting and strengthening, guiding and correcting and directing me by your Holy Spirit. What a glorious place it is to sit in heavenly places with the Lord. My beloved ones, He's raised us up together. He's made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see, when my spirit was created by the Heavenly Father anew, because Jesus died to pay the debt that I owed to sin, which was damnation and judgment. He paid the price, and He gave me a seat before the throne of God. By His name. You see, there's only one way you can get to that point. There's only one way that you're going to be able to have a visitation with the Heavenly Father, there's only one way you're going to sit in heavenly places with Him. And that's through Him. He said, no man comes to the Father except through me or by me. Why did He do all of that? Why did He care? Verse 7 says that in the ages to come, you see, beloved, when I accept the Lord as my Redeemer, my Savior, I come to the point where I enter into a relationship, a birthright, if you please, a, a new birth certificate that is written in the purity and the righteousness of the kingdom of God. And it says that in the ages to come, 
He might show, that means to reveal, to demonstrate, to illustrate, to express the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Born a sinner, born again by grace. His grace is sufficient. Verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. You see, beloved, God expects us to do nice things, kind things. He expects us to live an upright and, and a pure, holy life before the terrible condition of the nature of the sin of this world and the people who are bound in that terrible bondage. He expects us to do that. And we should and we can by the grace of God and the strength of God. Oh, the flesh overrules sometimes and we go weak and we let it have its way. And oh, what a pity, we shouldn't do that. But when we do, His grace, His grace is sufficient. And as I go before Him, his grace covers and cleanses and purifies and sets free. For by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. See, we can uh, have a pretty victorious life in the Lord and all at once, instead of giving God the credit, acknowledging, but the grace of God, I would be something else. I would be living a different lifestyle. I would be lost and damned to eternity without God. But by His grace I'm saved through faith. Praise His name. It's not because of me. And when any good thing comes to pass in my life, when any good thing is passed on through me to someone else, it's not me, beloved. It's the grace and the mercy and the gift of God that belongs to all who will accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Redeemer, Savior. It's not of works, verse 9 says, lest any man should boast. You know, one of the great warning signs of falling away from God is when God is moving and blessing you and ministering unto you or through you, and you begin to say, I did this. I did that. I had so many folks saved. No, you didn't. You, by the grace of God, was used as a vessel to send forth His Word, His Word being the gift of God, and because His Word went forth, others responded unto God, and they too found the same blessing you did. But don't you dare take credit for it. You need to say, Lord... I'm not worthy to be used. I'm not worthy to enjoy this seat that you've given me in your presence. And indeed, you are not, and I'm not. But you see, we are privileged. We are blessed. We are beautifully, beautifully increased in our love and ability and expression and enjoyment of life itself as as we serve the Lord and as we have our communion at the seat of the throne of God, that seat in heavenly places with my Lord Jesus Christ, it's important to me and it should be important to you. Beloved, I just want to share with you. It's not because we've done anything good. It's because the thing that happened to us that we understood that Jesus died for us and he gave us that new birth certificate, that new spirit wherein we learn in the word of God that old things are passed away and all things are become new within our spirit. Think about it, oh what a glorious and wonderful gift of God it is. Not of works, 
lest any man should boast. I've seen men who've had very humble beginnings in the ministry. I've seen them blessed in the ministry, used mightily of God. Their ministry grew, multitudes were blessed, lives were changed. God showed forth His Spirit in the work of redemption and salvation and in the miracles of uh, the activity of the Holy Spirit and God the Father through the promise of His Word, through the illustration that Jesus lived as He lived without sin before the Heavenly Father, demonstrating to all of us how we can live if we will only choose to once we've got that born-again experience in reality in our spirit has to go beyond our head. It's not an intellectual thing. It is a spiritual reformation, a spiritual new creation. And it's the gift of God. Verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God didn't want us walking around with a dead spirit filled with wrath and rebellion and terrible ideas and thoughts, carnality that allowed all kinds of sin and or the fruit of sin, let's call it, and all kinds of the deeds of sin. By the way, I want to tell you something, beloved. In God's eyes, sin is sin. Sin has one fruit, one. And that's death. And all of the things that come forth as a result of it. The fruit of its nature. The fruit of contamination, degeneration, and death. We are His workmanship, and we will continue to grow, continue to be formed into the likeness of His image of, as we go by day by day by day and year by year by year. He's dealing with us. He's working with us. He's guiding us. He's teaching us. He's restoring us. He's renewing us. He's replenishing us. He's saying, son, I've got to, got to take care of this rough edge you've got over here. It's not appropriate for the life that I gave unto you. And so, yes, the sandpaper comes and sometimes the sharp file that has to file the rough edges off because of this old carnal flesh of mine. And you'll find the same is true of you. But why are we saved? How are we saved? Well... We are saved because we have been quickened together with Christ. And He's raised us up together to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That He might show all of the world and all of the devil's angels what the righteousness imputed by the Son of God unto those who believe in Him, can do to defeat all raging and, and rebellion and evil works that go on in this world. It's the gift of God enabling us to separate ourselves from that and to walk in the righteousness and the power and the beauty of the spirit of the righteousness of Jesus Christ our Lord. What a privilege, and it's the gift of God. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, under good works. God hath ordained that we should walk in them. Not only did He ordain that we should, He gives us the ability, He gives us the strength, the wisdom, the knowledge, He gives us the willpower, if we'll just use it, to say no. No, I'm not going to fall into your trap, you devil. I'm not going to listen to you, you demon. I'm not going to put up with your attack constantly. 
you demonic force that comes against me. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, pastor, how dare you do that? I dare do it because I do it because the righteousness of the Spirit of the living Lord lives within. And by His name, every demon is bound, every power of hell. Folks, all of us, including me, still have many things to learn. But let's yield ourselves in the Spirit unto our Heavenly Father. And by the work of the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Let's be quick to respond when they begin to work and form and shape and, and develop with this old carnal body and mind. And thank God one of these days we're going to shed that carnality in the flesh and we're going to have a glorious new body, new renewed mind that is not contaminated and will never know discomfort hurt or pain, anguish or worry or care, again, because it's the gift of God. He loves us. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10, For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Now this is a change of subject, but really it is not. It's a continuation when God did what God had determined that he was going to do. It says that he rested on the seventh day. And what he's saying to the Hebrews, the Israelites, there's a day when you're going to enter into rest. And when you do, all of the labor, the works, the trials, the temptations, the victories, the joys, the beauties, the glorious experiences that you've had in the flesh are going to seem like nothing. Because you see what you're going to have is so many times more wonderful and glorious and perfect than that. You're going to come to that place where you don't have to struggle. You don't have to fight a battle. You don't have to come against the forces of hell. You don't have to worry about your paycheck or where you're going to live, whether or not you're going to be able to feed your children, how you're going to keep warm or cool. Why? Because we're the workmanship of God. Because we have been created anew in Him because He has given us the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, and because of His grace that we can accept and receive by faith. Verse number 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fail after the same example of unbelief. And he's talking about people who have known the righteousness of God, known the deliverance of the Lord Jesus Christ from the bondage of sin, actually been changed and renewed and have been born again. And then because they let their carnal mind and their fleshly desires and lust replace the work that Jesus did in them, they have slipped out of the kingdom of God, turned their back upon God, and he says, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fail after the same example of unbelief. They began to doubt. They began to fear. They began to walk by feeling instead of by faith. And they turned away from God. Verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If you fall away from God, 
nearly always it's because you have neglected the Word of God. You have known it, but you don't use it anymore. You don't walk in it. You don't believe it. You don't exercise its directives. And you begin to slip back to the old pig trough that you lived in and drank and ate from before you met Jesus Christ. Oh, I know there are those of you who say, well, you know, I accepted the Lord many years ago. I prayed the sinner's prayer, and uh, that's all I need. Well, let me tell you something. That's not nearly enough because you have been lied to. You have been led to believe that once you made that simple prayer, that that's all you needed to do, and you're going right straight to heaven when you die. Well, you need to read the Bible. You need to listen to the Word of God. And if you can't even come to the place where you can understand what you're reading, you need to say to the Lord, if you believe honestly in Him, and you really meant it when you said you wanted Him to forgive your sins, and you really accepted the fact that you were letting it go from your head to your spirit, you have a choice. And the Word is quick. It's sharp. It's true. It penetrates. It cuts. But it also heals. And it also brings renewal and comfort and deliverance. Are you willing to let God's Spirit, God's Word, empower you, quicken you, give you the ability to be what you need to be? Let Him cut away the carnality and the ideas and the hunger and desire for worldly fame and glory and whatever you lust after? Will you let him make you over? Well, you know, Pastor, I thought this and I thought that and I, I really had a, a, a thought in my mind that I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that, but I didn't do it. Well, thank God you didn't do it. But by the same token, you need to know that the Word of God says, He knows what you're thinking. He knows where your mind is. He knows what condition your spirit is in. When he says the intents of the heart, you can have worldly hunger and lust in your heart, your spirit. That's what it's talking about. And God knows it. Verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I know I shouldn't really be doing this, but I'm just, you know, I'm gonna, nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to... Nobody's going to see me. Uh, uh, I'm away from anybody that knows me. It won't matter what I do now. Oh, really? Really? He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're hungering to do and to be. And He knows what you intend to do. And because He knows... It's been my experience when I fall into such a trap, and I have down through the years from time to time. It's my experience that the Holy Spirit is quick. The Word of God is quick to be reminded to my spirit and into my spirit and into my soul. And sometimes in the moment of a heated uh, uh, anger, perhaps, I've done or said something I shouldn't have done or said, Sometimes in uh, just letting the old carnal flesh have its way. I want you to know that the Word of God is faithful. The Holy Spirit will bring it to your mind. And when the Holy Spirit brings to your mind, you need to say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
I'm glad you intervened. I'm glad you called it to my attention. I'm glad you challenged me. The problem is we get that challenge in so many times we don't listen. Well, nobody's going to really know. Really. God says he knows the intents of the heart. Verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast of our profession. Let us hold fast our faith. Let us hold fast our activities that we know are directed of God and are right. Let us reject the temptations of carnality and the challenges of the satanic forces of this world. Let us come to the place where we guard carefully that relationship that Jesus paid his very life for in such agony and torment at both the cross and the whipping post. The Bible says we don't belong to ourselves. We've been bought with a price and that price was tremendous. Value it, protect it, keep it, preserve it and listen to the word when the Holy Spirit challenges you in here and you know he's correcting or guiding or directing warning you of danger warning you of problems preparing you when you're about to be tempted that you will not sin we have a high priest passed into the heavens Jesus the Son of God let us hold fast our profession let us hold fast what the Lord has given us. Let us hold fast the development that He's already brought forth in our lives. Let us hold fast our faithful commitment that we made and walk in the fullness of, of obedience unto the will and the mind and the word of the living God. Verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. It's saying to us, hey, this isn't a new experience for you. This is something that the Lord, your deliverer, your redeemer, your a beautiful and wonderful uh, Savior that has delivered you from the bondage of sin, that has created within you a new spirit the Father has, the spirit of righteousness that Jesus bore as a man. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because I sit at the heavenly Father's feet. I've been lifted into the heavens, into the presence of the Lord in my spirit. Because of that, I can come boldly unto him. I can declare unto him my need. I can say, Father, Father, I need your help. And I come in the name of my Lord and Redeemer. Because Lord has saved me, delivered me, set me free. Because he was your gift unto me that I might have life instead of death throughout the ages to come. And with that, beloved, it's time for us to go to communion. Praise his name. Let us turn now to the book of Matthew, chapter number 26, and let's begin reading with verse 20. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man 
is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. And then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, the new covenant is what he's saying, which is shed for many, not for all, for many, for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. Let us take of the bread. Father, as we hold this chip of bread, it represents the torn flesh that the Roman soldiers tore from the back of my Lord and my Redeemer for me. And so, Lord, as I take of it, I recognize the terrible price that he paid. And I thank you for that, Father. And, Lord, I thank you for being willing to become the price that would set me and all others who would believe upon you free from the terrible law of sin and death. And so with that, Father, we ask you to forgive us of any sin as we take of it and eat together. In Jesus' name, let us eat. says he also took the cup, had grape juice in it, was wine. And he said, this represents my blood that I'm going to pour out. I'm going to spend that you might have life, is what he was saying to them and to us. As we drink of it, let us drink it with reverence and appreciation. But let us also drink with thanksgiving and love. Because he paid a price we could not pay. Father, we ask that you will bless this time as we acknowledge the terrible debt that was paid by Jesus, your only begotten Son, in our behalf. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we declare it. Amen. Let us drink together. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at Christian Living 101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona. 85050 or email Gene at Gene with a G-E-N-E Gene at ChristianLiving101 org at Gene with a G-E-N-E Gene at ChristianLiving101 org